Hello, my name is Lisa. Welcome to 100 Stories Deep. Today I am going to be reading a story called I'm a Vampire and that's by Teresa Solana and it's from this collection called The First Prehistoric Serial Killer. Uh, I chose this story because it's a, it's a mixture of the really gory uh, but also whilst being a little bit funny it's um, a depiction, uh, it's an imagina imagining of um, what it would be like for a modern day vampire. So I find it quite fun. Uh, a little warning, it is a bit gory and uh, there are also a couple of swear words in it. So if that's not your thing, turn off now. Uh, but here we go. I'm a vampire. I'm a vampire. One of the old guard. I can't even remember how long it's been. 900 years at the very least. But I have no complaints. I'm in really good shape despite the centuries I've been around. The vampire I once was, and the one I am now, share nothing in common. We are two different beings. I won't deny I've committed all kinds of excesses in the course of my lengthy career, but with time, I've learned to curb my natural instincts. You could say I've become a very restrained vampire. It's true, circumstances didn't give me much choice. I've proved to be an adaptable beast. When I first turned into a vampire, I did the usual. Slept by day, went out by night and sucked the blood of virgins. Nowadays, ever since I discovered sunblock and can venture out whenever I feel like it, I'm more of a day person. I have greater freedom of movement and that has helped me to change my habits and enjoy new experiences. Though naturally, in the heat of high summer, I don't act the fool. Sun creams are all well and good, they cost the earth and leave grease everywhere, but a vampire without a single gram of melanin in his skin had better not take any risks. I was born and became a vampire in Savai, a village that's now become an upmarket residential estate around a huge golf course. In the Middle Ages, when I was a youngster, Savai was a prosperous town with a castle, a lord of the manor and a vampire. The Lord of the Manor and the Vampire were one and the same, and the villagers were accustomed to yours truly paying a nighttime visit to suck the blood of their daughters. I still feel nostalgia for an era when virgins were reasonably easy to find, and relations with the church were good because the clergy was too busy burning heretics and expelling Jews, and left me to my own devices. What's more, a vampire in the locality was good for tourism. We pedigree classy vampires were much in demand. The people of Savai couldn't complain. Thanks to the gloomy air of my castle and the horrific stories they recounted about my misdeeds, the town was sitting on a regular gold mine. The good folk of Savai soon accepted my nightly incursions and reacted phlegmatically. They never harassed me and I in return sucked the blood of their daughters in moderation. Unfortunately, things changed in the area with the onset of the age of industrialization and all that nonsense about Marxism, atheism and the death of God. Psychoanalysis also did its best to downgrade me. It dubbed me a childhood trauma or worse. And the townspeople began to lose their respect for me. As some had read the novel by Bram Stoker, an Irishman, I ask you, one fine day they decided to set fire to the castle and crypt and they've been in a shocking state ever since. I'm not what you'd call a handyman. The fact is, I've become very refined over the centuries and have abandoned some unpopular practices. I've not sucked the blood of young girls for many years because I accept that it's not the done thing anymore. It's a barbaric custom. I survive by drinking the blood from the lambs and hens I keep in my yard and as the small farmers have gone to live in the city after selling their land to property developers, the Barcelona families who spend their summers here think I'm an eccentric and have invented a bunch of amusing anecdotes about me. Until quite recently then, my non-life as a vampire was a tranquil affair and mostly hassle-free. Nevertheless, it almost went pear-shaped a few months ago when something happened that really upset me and which to tell the truth, I still find perplexing. 
It all began one particularly hot August afternoon. It was almost twilight and I had gone out to fly because the crypt was like an oven and nobody could have stood it in there. As the chemist on the estate stays open till 10, I decided to pay a visit and buy a few tubes of sun cream. On my way to the shop in the centre of a sparse collection of houses that the spin merchants like to call a village, I went down one of the avenues between the villas. While I was roaming, wondering what I should do next, I was surprised to see graffiti on the west-facing walls of one of the mansions and froze to the spot when I read it. Somebody had scrawled the word vampire in red paint. I went around the house, scared stiff, and found a couple more bits of graffiti on the other garden wall. The first said, son of a whore, and the second, you're a vampire, Soribes. My hair stood on end and I almost fainted. I could hardly believe my eyes. For the first time in many a century, a vampire from elsewhere had established himself in my territory. In fact, it's not really mine, but I like to pretend it is. That unknown vampire and I had something in common. My mother had also earned an honest crust exercising the oldest trade in the world, but that was our only similarity. To begin with, this fellow lived in an upmarket mansion and not a crypt where you could have baked bread at noon. Secondly, this Soribis was a nomadic vampire, or at least a vampire who liked to travel, which was in itself intriguing because everyone knows that we vampires are territorial creatures and that other than in exceptional circumstances, we don't like moving far, let alone going on holiday. We think it's very vulgar. Besides, as tradition forces us to sleep inside a coffin and directly above the land of our ancestors, travelling is a real torture, not to mention the fact that we end up paying a fortune in excess baggage. The presence of a self-styled vampire in the area could be a problem that would have an impact on me and my routine non-existence. I didn't know the habits of my colleague and thus didn't know if he was a new vampire or if he implanted his fangs and donned his cloak at twilight before setting off in search of a maiden's fresh blood. In any case, someone in Savai was clearly on the case. I decided to investigate to be on the safe side. As it was dinner time and I was hungry, I forgot the sun cream and went back to the crypt and drank a lamb. While I was lying in my coffin digesting my meal, I thought up a strategy that would enable me to find out something without attracting too much attention or arousing the suspicions of my neighbours. I hadn't assumed the shape of a bat for years, but after carefully weighing up all the options, I concluded that the best strategy would be to try to slip in discreetly through a window and take a look around. I donned my cloak and flew off in the direction of the villa. I soon discovered I had a problem. Getting my bearings wasn't at all easy. There were too many aerials, satellite dishes and mobile phones sending out waves left, right and centre. We bats have very sensitive hearing and my head soon felt like a football with all those waves bouncing around. After crashing into an electricity pole that knocked me out for a while, I decided to forget about flying and walk there like a normal person. As soon as I reached the mansion, I transformed myself back into a bat and started to look for a window so I could fly inside. After circling around and around, I was forced to accept that it was impossible to get in that way. The cunning bastard had air conditioning. People used to sleep with their windows open in the summer, making it easy to creep in. New technology means that everyone sleeps with their windows shut when it's hot, so there's no way to get inside. Yet again, defeated by the wonders of progress, I had to recover my human form and force an entry, a delicate operation that's never been one of my fortes. What's more, the mansion was full of alarms and security cameras, and finally I had to beat it before the police arrived. I clearly needed to try a different tactic. The next morning, after I'd consulted my silk-lined pillow, I decided to speak to my friend Sebastià. Sebastià is a local Catalan policeman and we've known each other for almost forever. As the residential estate has changed Savai into a desirable luxury golf complex 
and the wealthy are a bunch of paranoids, Sebastian drops by now and again on the pretext that he wants to see if I need anything and to check that all is in order. In fact, I know the summer holiday crowd think I'm rather offbeat and send in to keep tabs on me. Sebastian is a fine fellow. He may not be very bright, but he's pleasant enough and full of common sense, a quality that's been lacking in these parts recently. He usually comes in his jeep once a week about 9am and eats breakfast with me. We walk around the garden putting the world to rights. While he gossips or complains that his wife spends too much with her credit card, I get him a bag of homegrown vegetables which he says are very tasty because they're so obviously organic. He insists on paying, I refuse to take his money, though I finally relent. To tell the truth, if it weren't for Sebastian and his fondness for my vegetables, I don't know how I'd afford my tube to sun cream. Thanks to our conversations, I know he usually goes to Barbessa's bar for a late morning aperitif. Sebastian had already paid me his regular visit, so I decided to go and see him in the bar and try to put my own skills to use as a detective. They looked astounded when I walked in. It's a place I avoid basically because it annoys me that I can't drink alcohol and because Barbes has a huge mirror hanging over the counter and I'm afraid someone will notice I don't have a reflection. I ordered vermouth and olives as routinely as possible and sat next to Sebastia, who was also surprised to see me. I justified my presence by saying I was on my way to the chemist to buy painkillers because my back was hurting. We argued for a while over whether lumbago was more painful than kidney stones. The latter finally won out. Sebastia started talking about the water restrictions that locals were having to suffer because of the golf course and the conversation immediately turned to the holiday crowd. I easily steered it to what was concerning me and whether my friends knew anything about the new vampire who'd set up in town. Sebastia, what's the meaning of the graffiti on the wall of the villa next to the duck pond? I asked as deadpan as can be. Ah, yes, the Cerebes family, Sebastia sighed. A vampire's moved in, old boy. You already know he's a vampire? Of course. As soon as he bought the villa, we knew what he was. What gets me, he added, is that I now have to catch the idiot who painted the graffiti. But if you know he's a vampire, why not simply kick him out? I'd like to, you bet, he chuckled. But then he suddenly got all serious and shouted, These sons of bitches have no right to suck our blood! What's more, you found him out. You know what he is. And thanks to the graffiti, everybody does. I tell you, forget the graffiti. Then, lowering his voice to a whisper, Sebastia leaned forward. I personally like to string him up by his balls in the middle of the town square. That would teach him and his ilk a lesson. I nodded. I understood how Sebastia was feeling because in my heyday, I used to drive people crazy and stir up similar feelings. Anyway, I decided not to tell him it wasn't a good idea to string him up by the balls because he'd simply fly off. And is this fellow sucking your blood as well? I'd heard of cases of vampires attacking sturdy, muscular men, but I always thought it must be a myth. Mine and the blood of everyone who's got a mortgage, he sighed yet again. And if only it were just him. But you're all right with your little house and garden. You're set for life. Are you sure there's nothing you can do? I insisted. There must be a way to stop him in his tracks. Sebastia shrugged his shoulders and chewed another olive. The Russians had a bash with their revolution and look what happened. And the less said about Cuba, the better. So this Soribes had wrought havoc in Russia and Cuba and I was totally oblivious. That was only to be expected. I read Cosmopolitan rather than the broadsheets. Do you reckon his wife and children are vampires as well? I asked, determined to leave the bar as well informed as possible. You bet, Sebastia responded, apparently totally convinced. You've only got to see his wife strutting around the golf club as if she were a duchess. And the children are vile. If I told you what they get up to at night, I think I can imagine. Those kids will be worse than their parents, you mark my words. 
I conspicuously ate an olive and realised the whole bar was looking at us. I judged it sensible to change tack and talk about more mundane matters while pouring my vermouth on the sly into a pot with a rubber plant, which immediately perked up. When we hit the road, that damned August sun was so blistering I had to rush back into the bar to avoid disintegrating. I used the excuse that my back was hurting and Sebastien offered to drive me home in his jeep. Once I was home, I immediately went to the crypt to rest because I was smouldering all over. In the jeep, I'd noticed my right hand had begun to smell scorched, so I took a painkiller before going to sleep. I also decided it was high time to install air conditioning in the crypt. I'm well aware it's most inelegant to be sleeping nude in a coffin. I had nightmares all day. I was out of sorts. So upset an unknown vampire was sucking my friend's blood and decided I must do something. Killing vampires is no easy task, but it was clear that was what I had to do. The first challenge will be breaking in by day and catching them all asleep. The second will be finding the stake for killing vampires. I had no idea where I'd left it. I was forced to give the crypt a thorough clean, which took a couple of days because you can't imagine the junk that piles up over nine centuries. Finally, the stake surfaced in the corner next to the skeleton of my great-great-grandfather, covered in fungi and cobwebs. I cleaned it up and put it in a sports bag next to the iron sword for decapitation. After transfixing vampires through the heart with a stake, you have the option of beheading them. There's been a lot of theoretical debate on the subject, but as these vampires were from elsewhere and unfamiliar with our customs, I thought it better to err on the side of excess. When in doubt, go the whole hog. I chose a cloudy afternoon when it looked like rain to put my plan into action. I knew they had a maid because Sebastia had told me and also that she wasn't a vampire because the Cerebuses were sucking her blood too. I knocked on the door politely and the maid almost fainted. Sebastia and the other locals were used to my pallor but people who have never seen me before are sometimes frightened by me. As the maid didn't seem to want to let me in and looked as if she'd ring the police, I decided hypnosis was my only course of action. I'd not hypnotised anyone for years. Initially it was an effort because the girl was hysterical and unfocused, but I succeeded after a few seconds and was able to enter the villa. Once I had the maid under control, I questioned her and she revealed that everyone except her, who had to do the ironing, was taking an afternoon nap. That was all I needed to know. I started to look for the cellar, where I imagined the Soribeses were asleep in their coffins, but however much I searched, I couldn't find a door down to any crypt. I questioned the maid again and was shocked by what I learned. The house didn't have a cellar, and the family slept in bedrooms on the top floor. Something totally unexpected. However, stranger things have been known. I took a deep breath and headed up the stairs, determined to carry out my plan. I opened the door of a very beguiling bedroom, papered in a Laura Ashley floral pattern, and immediately felt a shiver of pleasure run down my spine. The air conditioning was full on, and it was like an ice box inside, despite the heat in the street. It was exactly the powerful piece of technology I needed in my crypt. I took a mental note of the brand and continued my inspection. A middle-aged vampire was asleep in the bed. Rather reluctantly, I opened my bag and took out the stake and the sword. As I was surprised she was sleeping in a bed and not in a coffin, I wanted to check she was one of us. So before starting on my task, I lifted the sheet and touched her. She was indeed ice cold. I stuck the stake through her heart before she could wake up and then beheaded her. A deft, professional blow. Her head rolled across the floor, under the dressing table and came to a rest near her slippers, which is where I left it spurting blood. I assumed the vampire must have had a feast before falling asleep because the room was soon splattered in red and we vampires only bleed when digesting. The two youngsters were no problem either, but their room smelled pleasantly of strange herbs that put me on a high and made me want to laugh. 
While I was sticking the steak into Suribus, I did laugh, and the fool woke up. In fact, his screams rather dampened my spirits. Luckily, that was it. The Soribas vampires were history. Sebastia could stop worrying now. I retrieved my stake and sword and returned to my crypt, feeling as pleased as punch at a job well done. The following morning, Sebastia dropped by, and he didn't look too happy. I was still wearing the bloodstained shirt, but as Sebastia is red-green colourblind, I decided to let it slide. What's new, Sebastia? Anything the matter? I asked, knowing there'd been at least one change in town. For God's sake, haven't you heard about the disaster at the Suribes mansion? He replied, obviously distressed. No. Butchery, old boy. Real butchery. They've dispatched a contingent of police from Barcelona. The TV people are here as well. I've just popped by to tell you to watch out because there's a madman around. A madman? I asked, taken aback. A very dangerous madman. Yesterday, someone broke into the Soribes villa and stabbed a lot of them. Chopped off their heads as well. The four of them, husband, wife and two kids. This morning, the postman found the maid in a state of shock and discovered the corpses. He added in a worried voice, This is a psychopath at work. But he was a vampire, I replied wearily. Vampire or not, this was barbaric, countered Sebastia indignantly. I was really confused. I thought Sebastia would be pleased I'd destroyed the colony of blood-sucking vampires, but that clearly wasn't the case. Something had gone wrong. Keep a watch out, he shouted as he left. Keep your eyes peeled and change that shirt for Christ's sake. It's a mess. It's obvious I'm getting past it. There's no way I can understand these mortals. I've probably spent too long roaming this benighted world and the time has come to bid farewell. It's only fun being immortal if, in fact, you're not. And I've felt a little out of place for a couple of centuries. What's the fun in being a vampire if people aren't frightened anymore and the categorical imperative doesn't allow you to go around chomping on necks? These are questions I've been asking myself of late and I can find no answers. Perhaps the bottom line is that being a vampire isn't so wonderful. It's obvious I've really got my wires crossed over the Soribeses. I don't mean that Savai ought to organise a homage to me or name a street after me, though I don't see why not. But frankly, I was expecting a different reaction. At the very least, I thought that Sebastia would be thrilled to bits. At any rate, I did what a vampire had to do, and my conscience is clear. And isn't that what it's all really about? As my mother used to tell customers who couldn't get it up, at the end of the day, it's the thought that counts. The end. Thank you for listening. Uh, don't forget that you can watch and listen to more stories in the 100 Stories Deep series if you click subscribe using the link below. So I hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, before I head off, as usual, I will leave you with a little thought to end with. And that is um, that I was quite struck by uh, this character's response to being around for so long. And I just wonder how we would all feel if we were still here <laughs> in centuries to come whether you would want to, to still be here. So that's it. Thanks. Bye.